Dear friends, welcome to our TV show Shalom Israel, show about the culture, history, life and religion of Israel people. Today we have the privilege to have as guests Mr. Brett Ridley from Canberra, Australia. Welcome to our TV show Mr. Brett Ridley. Thank you very much. It's great to be here with you. What is the purpose of, of your visit in Romania? Um, I was invited along with a, another friend from the Pacific to uh, come to here to contribute to the prayer forum and but unfortunately my brother from the Pacific Islands wasn't able to make it. What, what is about this prayer forum we speak? Uh, it's to pray for or to come together and to discuss but also hear from God as to what he's saying for Europe and to share what uh, collectively what we have to, to understand from him. Um, I know that you are involved in South Pacific prayer movement. Yes. Um, what will be your contribution during the prayer forum? Well, uh, through the prayer movement in the Pacific, we have learnt a few things. Um, myself not being uh, an islander or an indigenous person, I'm sort of borrowing into uh, their, their contribution to the body of Christ. And uh, what, the, what we have learnt in the Pacific is the importance of protocol of respecting and honouring different peoples and their cultures and the, the way to approach each other by asking permission to come and to uh, stand on the land or to do business on the land that uh, another group of people are, are living in. Do you mean the natives or the indigenous? Of, of Primarily indigenous, but uh, with Western and uh, therefore European expansion across the globe, um, there's still protocols there uh, that are to be respected as well. Uh, as you uh, are here in Europe, um, there are simple things to honour and respect when you, when you go and uh, meet other people. Um, back in Australia, do you have a special relationship with Israel people um, in your place where you are living, in yes. Canberra. Uh, in order to understand this relationship with Israel, uh, may you share with us some aspects of your spiritual journey? Yes, I'll, I'll try. Um, as a, a young believer, very young, as in uh, less than a year, I understood um, through the commitment of what it was to be a believer that I didn't want to be a part-time believer. I wanted to give my life uh, to God and to the, to the kingdom. And so I set about to find out what that might be. And so uh, at, an early, at an early stage uh, in my faith, that I pursued ministry work uh, of, of various forms. So, uh, what are the major, the main uh, spiritual moments of, of your life, the early Christian life? <clears throat> well, uh, that's, that's not so easy to condense it, but I'll, I'll try to uh, touch on a, a couple. Coming from, uh, as we most do, from a local congregation, you tend to be insulated or isolated within that congregation. You don't see the world around you from a, a, a healthier perspective and so again when I was not long after uh, I was a believer uh, just a few years I attended a, um, a conference but uh, an outreach in Belgium uh, with Oper Operation Mobilization and so we gathered uh, initially in Offenburg Germany uh, there were 7,000 of us who uh, attended that mainly predominantly young people and there were a few who were over 30 but majority of us were well under 30 and uh, so 7,000 people from 70 nations approximately gathered together to come and uh, to Europe to take the word of, of God around Europe. And uh, my part of that was going to Belgium for four weeks. And so we, a team of 700 in Belgium, we participated in that. And so just the expansion of the kingdom in my understanding that the body of Christ is truly a global thing. You know, coming from a, a, a single congregation to come to an international event with 7,000 people is just, uh, it was life-changing. As far as I know, you came from Australia, from a, a farm place? Yes, my background is farming. My father is a farmer who's trying to retire. My brother is a farmer and he's trying to retire. You um, have a big farm back in Australia? Yes, uh, d depending on the context, but in our area it's about normal, but uh, to uh, in relationship to Europe and other countries, it's quite large. It's uh, about 20,000 acres, uh, which is, um, my understanding, around 8,000 hectares. So it's, it's a large place uh, in other And a lot of work. Oh, yes. Um, 
there are seasonal times on the farm where you, you require extra help to come in, extra work manpower to come. Uh, but normally it's my brother and my father and mother and my sister-in-law who take care of the farm. So start from a farming way to be hmm. and reaching uh, Brussels, Belgium and this uh, gathering of people uh, was a big change in your life. Yes, it was huge. Uh, coming from a, a not really a non-religious background, my, we were required to go to church when we were young, but once I got to the age of 10, it was no longer a re requirement. And so really a non-religious background. Uh, and it was only when I left the farm, left the country, the rural area that I was in, that I grew up in, and moved to a, a larger city, that uh, I, I came to know God, came to faith there. And so, yes, it was quite a a big change and to go from that again the local congregation where I came, came to the Lord to go to Europe and I've traveled the world a few times uh, and so yes it's a complete different uh, reality. So this stir up something new and fresh in your life you continue to be involved internationally after this conference? Oh yes the, um, I would say that that was uh, God's initial uh, point of contact for me to, for my horizons to be expanded and so I've continued to travel, be involved with Youth of the Mission and been in the United States, in uh, Spain and, and Malaysia with Youth with a Mission so uh, and that has only pr uh, led into other international activities as well so uh, still very international in my focus. So along the years you came to realize how big is the worldwide Church of Christ? Yes. How diverse is Yes, very, yes. Uh, you mentioned in the private discussion that you have been part in the, the Olympic, Olympics Games. Yes. Twice. Twice, that's right. In uh, 90, 1992 in Barcelona, I was uh, part of the outreach team there. I was not, uh, not, on, not evangelizing, but I was part of the infrastructure to assist others. Uh, there were, uh, I'm not sure, three or four thousand people in Barcelona with Youth of the Mission to uh, share the gospel with other people and in uh, Atlanta, Georgia in 96 I was there also doing a similar role uh, helping other people to go out and uh, preach the Word of God in uh, Atlanta, Georgia to the thousands who had come to Atlanta uh, to, for the games. Uh, as far as I know you are a carpenter. Yes I am. And this is um, it's something that is reminding us the, the profession of our Lord Jesus Christ you choose this by purpose or to be like Jesus or what is the <laughs> well, reason that? Uh, that was before I came to faith. Uh, it was really an interest uh, in working with my hands. Um, there was no real opportunity to work on the farm uh, because just the economics. It was not viable for me to become involved in the farm. And so I needed to reach out and uh, just carpentry was, uh, was there. It was something to do that was practical and uh, that s seemed attractive. So it's the correlation, it's quite a tenuous one, but... So along the years you have been a minister or working in the mission field and also doing this, this job? Uh, along the way I've uh, been happy to, to uh, do carpentry work, but also at, at times needed to do work to uh, support our in ministry involvement activity. And so uh, it's, it's a love for working with your hands, but it's also become a ne necessity as uh, maybe Paul would have... Uh, agreed that, uh, Apostle Paul that is, that, that uh, sometimes it's necessary and, and you, and you uh, interact with other people as well and share the gospel through them. Um, as I mentioned before, you have a special relationship with Israel people in, in Canberra. Uh, how you connected with Israel? Um, who influenced you to find uh, more about the chosen people of God? Through my, again, earlier years uh, of faith, I had no particular uh, aversion or, or attraction to Israel. I simply took them for who they were in the scripture and said, that's fine, that's who they are. But uh, obviously that was well short of uh, what I now understand. And so really it was God who uh, told me in 1988 uh, to uh, go to Israel and I was a little bit uh, casual about it and I had forgot and so in 99 he uh, reminded me again to go to Israel and so I went uh, in the f uh, s 
I'm not sure, in my fall, uh, springtime, sorry, my springtime in Australia, went to uh, Israel and uh, no, didn't know anybody there, just arrived on the shores uh, in Israel and stayed a few nights and uh, felt lost in, God, what are you saying? What do you, what do you, <laughs> what do you want for me here? And uh, so I struggled for a few days to understand what he was doing. And then through somebody who I knew of, I didn't know them, um, they helped me get connected with people I did know. And it was simply the hand of God just drawing me and uh, directing me into the things that he really wanted me to see and learn. So you felt welcome in the Holy Land? Yes. Uh, initially, again, it was a bit of a, a challenge. But no, uh, God had set things up, up for me to be there and, and people to meet and uh, therefore learn and understand uh, more about Israel and the people. What you learn the most in the, during this first visit in the Holy Land? Sadly, nothing as profound as I would have liked to have uh, learnt, but maybe it really is profound and simply to be able to appreciate the context of the land, the geography, as you read the scripture, you understand where things took place and just gives you a greater intimacy for the land, but for the word of God as to how things were uh, during the time of the scriptures being written or, or before they were written, uh, to appreciate some of the dynamics and the relation, some of the how the relationships would have worked again geographically, how things fitted in, and so that was the real thing, and may it not have been uh, significant at the time, but yet I'm sure that it really is. Is this real? This statement that visit in Israel change your perspective about Israel as a people? Not initially, but yes. Um, after that first trip, I had we were living in the United States at the time, and so I went home to uh, Colorado. And uh, after that trip, God just began to bring people or bring, take me to people who uh, had a different understanding. And we spent time in prayer and uh, learnt new things from God about Israel and about what he had for me. And therefore, it was where I fitted into his picture that really was the, the key to the whole thing. It's not where Israel is. Yes, they are significant, but, but where, who I am in his sight and therefore who I am to be to Israel as a believer. As um, a minister and a missionary in the United States, also you met your wife? Actually met her in Sydney, Australia. Sydney? But uh, soon after we you moved, in. moved to America and we were married there. She has the same openness for Israel? Very much so. Um, I think that she was much like me and uh, uh, along the process. And when I came into contact with a greater understanding, she simply embraced and took hold of the same things without any question, without any doubt. So when do you realize that God has a special relationship towards Israel, with, with Israel? Obviously it's in, the, it's in the words, in the scripture, so it, it's there, you see it, but you're asking about what, for me, what I understand is to be the revelation. Yes, the revelation. The revelation of who Israel is in God's sight. Um, I don't think that there was a particular moment that I can pinpoint, but I know early in 2000, 2001, uh, again, processing th these things that God had uh, been showing me and showing me. And I, I guess it was just a matter of all of a sudden, I did actually know or, or I felt um, his heart toward his people, his original chosen people. Um, so I can't pinpoint the time or the, or the way it happened, but I know that it was uh, it was a revelation, and that's my perspective on people who do not yet appreciate who Israel are in God's sight. They haven't yet had the revelation. Again, you can read the scripture and it's there, but without the revelation, without the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart about them, then uh, Israel is just another people. So in your spiritual journey, it was a continued process of increasing awareness about Israel. Mm. And uh, turning back in Australia, what year you turned back in Australia? After living in the United States for a few years, we returned in 2000, 2000. to Australia, just prior to the Olympics there. What happened in, the, in terms of relationship with Israeli people in Australia? Um, initially, we, we were living in Sydney and through other friends, the ones that I had actually met in Israel on the first, my first trip there, through them, uh, we slowly began to get to know a few uh, Jewish people in, in the Sydney area. And my wife became a part of an organization called WITSO, uh, which is Women's International Zionist Organization, Zionist organization. 
Um, and uh, so they they had a, an arrangement where they could have a, be a friend of Wito, even though you weren't Jewish, you could be a friend of this organization so you could participate with them. And their objective was to raise funds to send to Israel for orphanages and schools, for primarily for children, I think, or or uh, medical situations, hospitals and so forth as well, to see them uh, f facilitated in Israel. So we got to know some people in uh, in Sydney initially. And how the relationship developed? Um, well, that was only for a couple of years, and then we uh, moved to Canberra in 2003. And that afforded us an opportunity that we didn't have in Sydney. Sydney, we lived quite a long way from the Jewish most of the Jewish people, Jewish communities in Sydney. And so that just uh, a geographical divide and didn't make things very easy for us. But in Canberra, it was a different story. Uh, we knew there was a community there, a Jewish community in Canberra. And so soon after we moved to Canberra, we simply began attending services, Shabbat services. And uh, I think it was the second or third one we were there and uh, a man about my age said, uh, would you like to become a member of the community? I said, well, Yes, we would. We'd be very happy to become members. But we are not Jewish. But I'm not Jewish. No, um, I'm not sure how unique it is. But in Canberra, <coughs> again, like the WITSO organization, um, you're allowed to become an associate member. If you're not Jewish, you can become an associate member of the community, which gives you uh, rights, in a sense, to be there, to participate. Um, but you don't have full rights because you're not Jewish, you don't have obviously their perspective and you can't speak for them, so you don't. You can't vote on decisions that the community would uh, make for themselves. But uh, everything else is open to us to participate and be involved. And what they are doing as a member of this Jewish community? Well, in addition to uh, attending Jew uh, Shabbat services, um, the festival services that they have, we um, help to organize them. Uh, my wife cooks in the kitchen sometimes and I've cooked in the kitchen a, a few uh, once or twice. Um, I uh, am involved in the security uh, duties of the for the center. They are understandably uh, cautious about who they let in and out of the facility and so I'm one of the security people there. And uh, just uh, any other events or activities that they're involved in, we are able and uh, welcome to participate in. So you worship God together and yes. pray together with the Jewish people? Yes. It's quite interesting not to be a Jewish, but to hmm. be part of the Jewish community. Um, in this context of being together, what do you have learned about them, hmm. about the Jewish people? Being so close and establishing yes. relationship with them? Yes. Admittedly, it's not easy. Um, it's easy to learn from them and learn about them, but it's not easy in the relationship um, because they know I'm a believer. They a believer in Yeshua. Believer in Yeshua. Sorry, um, they initially were very cautious because you know they have a history of um, being forced or being told that they are wrong by us Christians, saying, "You don't, you Jewish people, you don't have it all. You, you, you're wrong. You, you've missed the Messiah." And so, of course, there are barriers in the relationship. And it took actually a few years for that relationship to get to a place where they warmly uh, accept us now. Whereas the first few years, it was just, it was a cool relationship. And so, uh, so it's been difficult to learn, but one of the key things is how they view themselves. They, again, from the history uh, that's been forced upon them, or partly their own choices, of course, but through their history, they have had to consolidate themselves wherever they go in the world they have to maintain their identity and so they work hard at being Jewish so that they can say that we are different we know that we are God's people and uh, whether they have any real faith in God or not whether they are progressive Jew Jewish people or Orthodox Jewish people um, they are convinced that Jew being Jewish is a significant thing and uh, they do actually have a purpose in life that that is unique or at least different in some regard to all the other peoples around the world. So there are many things that we have learned, but that is one of the key that they work hard at being Jewish because they need to maintain their identity because um, they do understand that they have a purpose in the, in the world. This is affecting all the life and all the family? I, I believe that's my observation, yes. Um, 
why else would uh, you choose to be a persecuted person and maintain the identity that is persecuted by most of the world? Why else would you hold on to that if they didn't believe that they had something unique to contribute to the world? It's, uh, it's a very uh, sobering thing to witness this understanding in another person or another group of people. You mentioned that it's not easy to, to be accepted. No. Um, why? We, the, because it, mainly because we Christians have uh, done so much to the Jewish people through history um, and even re and concurrently like re recently I was uh, in, a, in the service uh, at the Jewish Center in Canberra and they were talking about an event that was coming up and they are always on their guard because they, uh, there was a multi-faith uh, activity coming up and they're always on their guard because they know what the other religions believe, what their other ad religions attitude is towards Israel. And so they're constantly on their guard, particularly with Christians, because we are so good at marginalizing Jewish people and putting them down and not recognizing and not honoring them for the understanding that they have for their for their heritage or where they came from. We we uh, approach them with a superior attitude, sadly, and so they are very defensive and very uh, aware of that reality. Again, today, but also historically, where we have done so much against them, and so the the difficulties are just there that uh, that you need to be persistent to work through. So, in the last six years, you resisted to be part of this, in the good words, to be part of this Jewish community. They accepted you and your family. What you have learned from them, yourself, for, mm -hmm. for yourself? Um, again, many things, um, but uh, it's difficult to uh, collect them all into a moment. But it's, uh, the other side of the coin of what I'm just saying about our attitude towards them is that we, as believers, really have so little understanding of the Scripture, so little understanding of the context, of the historical context of the time of when uh, things were written. Um, because the scriptures are their scriptures, at least the Old Testament primarily is, are their scriptures. And whether they were born in the land or not, they just have an understanding and appreciation for the history of where their people have come from. They're, they are connected to the land, uh, to, whether they really understand it or not, they are connected to the land. And so because their spiritual DNA ties them back to the land, they just have an ability to interpret and to read the scripture far better than we do. Not that they interpret it correctly all the time, as in some of the progressive circles, but um, they simply have a, a, an ability to grasp the scripture and the context that things were spoken in and a, and a wonderful appreciation of, of life that, that we as believers really um, don't measure up to when, on the average. So in some way they succeed to be what was the purpose of God for them, to be light of the world? Oh definitely, yes. and. They might occasionally be arrogant or proud about that, but in the world that we live in, I think they have a right to be. Uh, but yes, they, uh, they are a unique people and they understand to some degree, if not a large degree, their, their identity and their purpose to be a blessing to the world. Uh, do you try to influence them spiritually as a Christian? I would like to think that I could, but, uh, but because I, I'm... I'm not terribly confident that I could uh, compete with their intellect and their theological uh, background. I, I don't actually try. But also in addition to that, I don't see that it's my purpose to try and convince them that I have something that they need. Um, I, I believe it's much more important that my life testifies to them about who God is and what He has done in the, in the, greater, the fullness of, of His Word. Um, not limit, again, not limiting to the Old Testament, but to expand on the New Testament and to love them, accept them for who they are, to honor them and to respect them, knowing that they are God's people. And again, through my lifestyle, my action, my attitude towards them, that they will see that there is something to this faith that I have that is more than uh, the Old Testament faith that they rely on. So you re do you re really believe and apply the... The gift of God that is the free choice. You don't force them to to listen to you or to no to accept what you believe. No, uh, again, like I, I, I probably didn't say it quite clearly enough. 
Again, because of the issues, the historical issues between Christians and Jews, the barriers are there and to try and beat on those barriers, to beat on them and to beat on them is not going to easily or even effectively reach them with, with the truth of the love of God through Yeshua. But again, to have a lifestyle that uh, honors them and respects them for who they are and where they've come from and where they're at today. It's, they don't have an easy life. They, uh, again, are persecuted. I'm part of the security team there because they are concerned about who will try to come in to their community in Canberra and cause destruction or devastation in some way. And so they know that they are a persecuted minority. And why do I need to add to that by trying to tell them that they're lost, that they don't know all that they should know, but rather just allow my life to be a testimony? In the Jewish world, especially in the, in the Orthodox circles, they are very reluctant of the Christians who are called missionaries. Mm, yes. They try to convert them and to make proselytes among the Jewish. Uh, how you see this, this approach to be aggressive in evangelization towards Jewish? I'm not actually sure. I'm often uncomfortable with the whole idea because of where I come from, where my gifting and what my calling is in God. Um, I know that evangelistic people, like so, uh, believers in Yeshua, who are more evangelistic in their gifting, um, they are almost driven by a, uh, an inner motive to, to go and preach and, and teach and uh, reach out to people. And so while I understand that that is real within us, as some of us as Christians, or most of us, um, I struggle with it because, because, again, because of the history. On one hand, there, there is great fruit that comes out of that. But on the other hand, the community in Canberra, the communities in Sydney, the communities in Melbourne are very opposed to uh, organizations who actively pros or attempt to proselyze uh, Jewish people. And real it really adds to fuel to the fire of their, what they would say is anti-Semitism. Like they, would, they could easily transfer that into saying, well, you're anti-Semitic. You won't allow us to be us. You won't allow Jewish people to be themselves. You, are trying to force them into being something different. And for me, I cannot speak for all believers, but for me, I, I question the bigger picture, the fruit of the bigger picture. Can we really force the kingdom of God onto the Jewish people? Or are we just called to uh, be a light ourselves, be an example through our lives? So you and your family, you are in a context, unusual context for them many people around the world to live together and to share together life and, mm. yes. and, and uh, spiritual matters with the Jewish people. So uh, you mentioned that it's not the easy way hmm. no. from both sides, but along the years they start to accept you yes. and to uh, establish friendly relationship. Um, how long do you consider to continue this relationship with the Jewish community? Um, that is a simple one, and I again, it was a point of revelation for me. It's not a, it's not a conscious decision that I made, but in my learning about who the Jewish people are, about how what what I believe, what I understand, God, how God feels about them, for me, and I and I really do believe for all of us as believers in Yeshua that our attitude should be, it's a lifelong thing until the Lord returns. That we need to embrace the Jewish people. We need to love them. To encourage them and support them in whatever way they will allow us to and so our relationship with the community in Canberra is uh, until it is no longer possible in some form but uh, I'm as committed to the Jewish community in Canberra as I am to my brothers and sisters around me. Um, I'm asking these questions because uh, there is a larger context regarding the revelation of God about the end times it's not about only you and your family that is approaching and coming closer with the Israeli people, but it's also regarding the worldwide body of mm -hmm. Yeshua that is called to turn back to the sons of Israel. Yes. In this context of our discussion, how do you interpret uh, verse, verses from Micah chapter 5? Uh, maybe you can read yes. the verses and then to have a little comment about the scripture because this open a perspective about the end times and the, the role of Israel in the end times. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you may read this. Okay, I'll, I'll read uh, Micah 5, uh, 1 to 3. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughters of troops. He hath laid siege against us. 
They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of these shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Therefore will he give them up until the time that which she which travaileth hath brought forth, then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. Is this applying to your life? It does. It, it definitely does. Um, I honestly cannot say that I understand the full prophetic dimension uh, of how things will unfold, but I'm strongly convinced that Israel will return to their father and that we have a, a role to play in that, that we, again, are to love Israel to, uh, in some way, again, through our lives, but as words uh, are necessary and available to help guide them into the path of, of the fullness of God has for them. But uh, while all that is true for us, for, for me today, a simple understanding is of God's attitude towards them. Again, it's, it's the genesis of my commitment to the Jewish community in Canberra that is understanding how God feels about them, whether no matter where they are at today in the world, uh, whether they're secular or pluralistic or religious or uh, ultra-spiritual, it's irrelevant, but to love them, to bless them, to accept them as who they are in their origin, of who God made them to be, and to simply say, I love you, because you are God's original children. You're the original chosen people. We talk about your personal experience in your personal life, but it's the same pattern, the same things happen in, in the South Pacific, in, in the islands, and the, with other people? Yes. Um, I don't know all the contexts of the world, but in the Pacific, the island peoples of the Pacific have a great love for Israel. Um, beyond anything that I've seen, they, uh, I guess, through revelation, but I guess also that they simply read the scripture and they see who Israel is and they accept that and receive it. And their support of Israel is, I, I think, unparalleled in the world where a few of the Pacific nations have never voted against Israel in the UN. Um, and so it's beyond understanding, really, other than God's hand being upon the Pacific peoples. In some ways, they are simple. They're simple in their faith, simple in their lifestyle. But I guess with that simplicity comes the ability to accept truth. When you speak about the Pacific uh, peoples, what, what do you mean? You can mention some nations? From uh, yes. Um, in Micronesia, which is the northern, uh, up towards Asia, the northern, northern part of the Pacific region, um, there are many nations in there, Palau, uh, Federated States of Micronesia, and a, and a few others. They are very much behind Israel, Papua New Guinea, uh, Vanuatu, Solomon Islands, uh, Tahiti, Samoa, Tonga, New Zealand, Fiji, uh, New Caledonia, and uh, again, quite a few others as well. There are more, many more than that, but they are uh, peoples who, who do stand with uh, Israel. It's interesting because in the, in the, the Old Covenant, the Covenant of God with Abraham, it's written that whoever bless Israel or, mm. or the, the seed of Abraham will be blessed by God. May you see in these days this blessing of God coming upon these nations? I because believe, of the attitude towards Israel. I believe so. Many of them have only had the gospel for 100, 150 years. Some of them maybe a little bit longer than that. And in some ways, they, as nations uh, of faith, they are very young. But at the same time, their ability to take hold of the word of God and apply their lives uh, according to the scripture, then uh, in conjunction with their love for Israel, then yes, these people are a blessed people. And um, it's a little bit uh, provocative to say so, but I, I believe that the Pacific peoples will lead the world in a revolution in the kingdom of God that we will see out of the Pacific a move of God because of the humbleness of the island people. You mean the Polynesians and the Melanesians and Micronesians people? Yes, yes. Uh, as part of this prayer movement in South Pacific, um, 
having common friends as uh, Michael Melio and Milo mm. Silata and other uh, leaders, Christian leaders in this part of the world. Uh, you promote a vision worldwide yes. about the mm. glory of God. Yes. The coming down of the glory of God and the fulfillment of uh, the prophecy from Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14. It will come a time and the glory of God will cover the world as the waters co cover the bottom of the seas. Uh, what is about this vision of the glory of God and how this was released to the worldwide body and how mm. it's advancing right yes. now? That's quite a lot, but uh, yes, we'll, I'll try and cover some of that. Michael Melio uh, is a, a man from the Solomon Islands, a leader, a church leader there. And uh, the Solomon Islands actually is, according to uh, the history, is the youngest Christian nation in the world, or it's the last nation in the world to receive the gospel. So in, in one sense, they are the ends of the earth. They received the gospel last as a nation. And so whether that has any substance in, in the sight of God, I don't know. But uh, for them, that stirs them along. But uh, apart from that, Michael, uh, back in the 80s, 86, I think it was, received a vision. And uh, I'm not sure how the name came uh, specifically, but the name, the Deep Sea Canoe Vision, uh, is descriptive of how they moved amongst the islands. They would travel in deep sea canoes from one nation to another, one island to another. And this vision that he received uh, is a picture, of course, of what Michael has understood to be a move of the glory of God or a move of the Holy Spirit, the last great move of the Holy Spirit. And uh, the vision speaks about uh, a mist that originates out of the Solomon Islands and it moves around the Pacific two times. Um, and then as, it, as it's leaving the Pacific, it goes through Papua New Guinea and goes across to uh, the Americas. But uh, as it leaves Papua New Guinea, it's no longer a mist. It turns into three currents or three streams that move through the ocean. Uh, towards the Americas and when these three streams uh, reach the America um, one continues to go eastward across the United States one heads north towards Canada and Alaska and another stream heads down around South America and so these three streams continue to, to travel and when they come to the east coast of the of the Americas they turn back upon themselves and become a tsunami a tidal wave of glory Yes, of glory. And as they come and sweep back across the earth uh, in, from those three directions, one um, heads back across uh, over the Antarctic and northern, northern Europe and uh, stops and waits uh, in Europe. And the southern one goes across the southern hemisphere, uh, I think the uh, southern part of Asia as well, and Africa, and then stops and, and waits uh, at the top of Africa. And the, the third one in the center goes back through Asia, through China and uh, Russia and Russia and those nations there. And uh, as it ar arrives uh, with the other two, they, they uh, converge around Israel and they, they simultaneously fall in on Israel. And as they hit Jerusalem, uh, there's an eruption that takes place like an atomic bomb, but there's a, a pillar that comes up into the, into the sky and then like a mushroom cloud. Of water, of mists. Uh, of mist, but yeah, the expect the the uh, understanding is that it becomes a, a glory cloud, and the glory covers the earth as the waters cover the sea, as the scripture in Habakkuk. So this mushroom cloud just envelops the whole earth uh, with the glory of the Lord. So this vision speaks about uh, move back of the glory from the end of the earth, yes. of the world, yes. towards Jerusalem. Correct. So being part of this vision and there are people in this in the, in the south pacific that promote this vision worldwide what happened in the last years we uh, the premier in the pacific has been going as long as the vision uh, originated and the last few years again we've been following the the vision uh, and in 1997 we were in papua new guinea and we launched the uh, the progression of the vision out to the Americas, and in 90, um, sorry, 97, 2007, um, we launched it from Papua New Guinea in 2008. We arrived in Hawaii, and we we see that we are carrying the glory of the Lord, a move of the Holy Spirit to touch peoples, to touch indigenous peoples, to release indigenous peoples, 
uh, within the Pacific. And now this year we're in July in uh, California. And so the, again, progressing with the vision, we've touched down in America and we've connected with the Native Americans there. And there's been a, a significant uh, coming together between the Pacific Island peoples and uh, the Native Americans and to honor them and to uh, respect them for who they are, the custodians of the land. We sent a delegation ahead to ask them permission to come to America like we, we do in the Pacific as well. We do that each year. When uh, we're preparing for the next year, we un try to understand from God which nation is to be next. And so there is a delegation that goes ahead to ask permission. Can we come to your country next year, to your land, and uh, have a, a celebration, a gathering? Um, for the Lord and so we did that in in America this year and uh, it was a wonderful time in California to meet with the Native Americans and to see the diversity the difference between the Pacific Islanders and the Native Americans um, but yet the commonality also the the similar understanding of attachment to the land re responsibility to the land of the of the people of the land and the, therefore the authority that they know that they have as well. Why it's important to acknowledge their authority? The spiritual authority of the native people, why it's important? If we understand that we're all created by God and that the nations didn't create themselves, but at the, as we read in the scripture, that at the Tower of Babel, God scattered the peoples around the earth and he didn't just throw them and they landed wherever they landed. He destined peoples for lands and, and locations and gave them identities and cultures. And the event is written according with the number of the sons of Israel. Yes. And so uh, the dispersion of the people around the world was just not by chance, it was by design, so that the world would be covered with people. And uh, so he made, them, he made us unique and different uh, according to which land we ended up in. And so if God designed something then how, who, how can we, in this modern day, or even historically, say that, well, you're, you're not relevant, you're not significant, but know that he gave the land to people, gave the responsibility of the people to take care of the land, as uh, it speaks in Genesis, where Adam was commanded, Adam and Eve were commanded to take care and subdue the earth. And so, as through Babel, the, the occurrence of Babel, um, God spread that around the world and gave the land to people to take care of it. And so we need to respect that because that is a, a ordained thing from our Father, that they have authority in the land and if we, we need to go to those people and ask them permission to come to their land so that we have the legal right, otherwise we're entering illegally, otherwise we're just from a illegal immigrants. From a spiritual perspective, you mean? Uh, from a spiritual perspective, but even from a relational honoring perspective as well, that if we go to somebody else's house and just walk in the front door and make ourselves at home, um, are we not just thieves and robbers if we do that? Yes. And so practically, relationally, it's an important thing to do, but also spiritually, if God gave a people responsibility for our land, that we must come and ask them permission to come to their land. Recently in New York, I spoke with an Apache yes. a, a lady, a sister in Christ, and she said so many times. People came and abused mm. the indigenous and natives, natives of the United States, never asking about permission to enter and to do some spiritual matters in the land. And uh, it was a time of understanding, humbling myself, mm -hmm. realizing that you cannot do everything you like in another nation. You must be accepted and to, if you want to bless, you must recognize the spiritual authority over the mm -hmm. land. Hmm. This is pointing my mind to another, another issue that is a big issue right now and all over the world. It's about Middle East. Ah, yes. What's about hmm. Israel and the right of Israel hmm. upon the land, of the promised land? Yes. What do you can say about it? What is your understanding and belief? I, as people would say that we are an involved people, I think we, we trip ourselves up with saying the word Israel was not there originally, and no, they were not there originally, but you have to go according to God's direction and according to God's design. Uh, outside of the kingdom of God, you don't have no reason to accept the word of God as his word, as his directives. But as believers, we have to take hold of his word and say, this is what God said, and God gave 
the land of what we now call Israel to the Israelites. He gave that to them. Even though there were peoples there before, he said to Abraham, the, the time has not yet come, that the fullness of their sin has not yet come, but the time will come when this will be your land. And so at the appropriate time, God brought the Israelites to take care or take possession of that land that he had set apart for them. And so the peoples that were there before the Israelites came, they were removed according to God's instruction, according to his design and purpose. And so it's not that the Israelites were the first people there, but they were there by his ordination, by his calling and by his destiny to take that land. They still have this right of, upon the land? Um, in my view, unquestionably, they have never truly been dispossessed. Yes, they were sent into exile, um, but they have never been completely removed from the land, and nor has there been any instruction, to my knowledge, that uh, another people was to take their place in that land. And uh, the peoples that have come in, who we now call the Palestinians, uh, primarily were not indigenous to the land. They came from the lands around and just came and settled there. And so they are settlers and they have the right to settle, um, but they do not have the right to take authority and control of the land and uh, say that the Israelites have no place there. So as a part of a Jewish community in, in Australia and part of a prayer movement, you really are on the side of uh, Israel as a nation in the Middle East and uh, scattering people around the world. Yes. So um, I, I consider this like a, a sign because um, it is written in Isaiah chapter 40 to comfort, comfort mm -hmm. my people, says God. Yes. Um, to speak this word of comforting to, to Israel. And uh, Lord God said, if you do that, you will see the glory manifested all over the world. Mm. There yes. is a special relationship the Lord designed to be established among the worldwide church and the old covenant people, Israel people. Mr. Bradley, they thank you very much for uh, participating mm -hmm. to our TV show, uh, sharing with us our experience with God and your ministry and uh, this particular relationship with the Jewish community in Canberra. Um, I hope that many people will get inspiration from your, uh, your testimony. Yes. And uh, knowing that we have four children and uh, I know that you teach them the same mm. yes. love towards Israel. We wish you that the gods, gods of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to bless you and your family and your ministry. And dear friends, Thank you. until the next show, we wish you to all of you Shalom, Shalom Israel, Shalom Romania. Purrahim,